omens, oracles, and astrology. The Christian Church condemned magical operations even when they aimed at good. A magician who by magic words healed a neighbor's cow might suffer a fate similar to that of a witch who had placed the curse of sickness. The Greek religion was less rigid. No ecclesiastical authority ruled. While having strong links to the old usage, it welcomed fresh revelation. All that mattered was that the magic should have a beneficent pur purpose and to serve the commonweal. This applied both to practitioners of magic, who were members of the priesthood, and to freelance magicians. Plato, in his Laws, ordains, He who seems to be such a man who injures others by magic knots or enchantments, be he a prophet or a diviner, let him die. But in the Timaeus he declares divination from the liver of slaughtered animals to be a good and legitimate deed a remedy which God combined with the liver and placed in the house of the lower nature, the body, in order that, in the liver, the power of thought, which proceeds from the mind, might be reflected as in a mirror which received the likeness of objects and gives back the images of them. Death punished similar acts when practiced criminally. Apollonius of Tyana was brought to trial in Rome when it was declared that he had sacrificed a boy to divine the secrets of futurity which are to be learned from youthful entrails. This could hardly have been an exceptional practice, for the law provided specifically against it. Spontaneous prophecy was interpreted as a divine gift bestowed upon the worthy. Plato, in his Apology, causes Socrates, under sentence of death, to say, and now, O men who have condemned me, I would fain prophesy to you, for I am about to die. And the, in the hour of death, men are gifted with prophetic power. And in the Symposium, Plato terms the divinatory arts as a whole communion between gods and men. Mythical Orpheus was thought to have fathered all prophecy and founded all initiations and mysteries. His melodies brought back the dead. The Orphic religion was already flourishing in Greece 600 years before Christ. Orpheus's head was preserved in the Isle of Lesbos, with its magical power still alive. It foretold the future. Melampus understood the language of birds that the snakes had taught him. Epimenides lived 300 years and had slept 30 of them. Melisangus, the divine soothsayer, practiced his art in Athens. Bacchus was possessed by nymphs, and the daughters of springs and sources spoke through his lips. Last of the select company was Apollonius of Tyana, who lived in the first century of the Christian era. His power was hailed as that of a god, and many communities in Asia Minor raised temples and shrines to this rival of Jesus the Nazarene. Clairvoyance was most intimately bound up with daily religion. The oracles were consulted as to the future, and old seers witnessed sacrifices and other religious ceremonies. From the intestines of the animal, from the way its entrails burned, from the sacrificial flame, one sought first to know whether the sacrifice was acceptable and pleased the gods, then, avid for more knowledge, one searched these phenomena to find the wisdom of the immortals. The word oracle means answer. Priests might speak with the god through the Pythia, a female medium. Narcotic smoke or natural fumes rising from the earth brought the medium into a state of trance. In Argos, to achieve the same end, the Pythia drank the blood of lambs. Once the godly spirit had entered the body of the Pythia, the priest posed his questions receiving replies of the Olympians through their mouth. Most of these answers, produced in a strangely altered intonation, were ambiguous. Lucian scoffed at the ambiguity. Only a second Apollo could have elucidated the statements of the first. Thus the Pythia is said to have warned Nero, Beware of the sixty-third year. 
Nero interpreted the caution as applying to his own age, but it referred to the 63rd year of Galba, who overthrew him. The most celebrated oracle was at Delphi, on the slope of Mount Parnassus. Surrounding boulders gave back a wondrous echo. Vapors emanated from a natural grotto, and in a crypt stood the image of Apollo, framed by laurel. When the oracle was to be rendered, the Pythia, sitting on a golden tripod, moved closer to the steaming crevasse. Soon she was overcome by a divine delirium. Her neck swelled, her body writhed in convulsions, her head jerked violently. The crisis was shocking enough to fill all who beheld her with religious awe. These mantic phenomena are seen in their full importance when we recall that any religious ecstasy was believed to be divinely inspired. People among the crowd at the Orphic and Dionysiac festivals would, in a state of hysteria, utter prophetic words. In daily life, the flight of birds, the whispering of the trees, the sneeze of a neighbor were premonitions sent by the gods. Centuries of anticipating such portents must have sharpened the senses of the Greeks. Constant alertness added not only to their occult knowledge, but also to their powers of observation in the broadest sense. Oracles and omens played an influential role in political life. No war was declared before consulting the gods. And more than once the oracle, which also confided strategic advice, started a war. One might say that at times the soothsaying Pythia of Delphi served as Greek minister of war and foreign affairs. Generals were ever anxious lest an evil omen should bring panic to their armies. In the 4th century BC, when Timetheus was about to sail with the entire Attic fleet, the sneeze of a soldier caused a standstill. The army hesitated to board ship until Timetheus, laughing, though scarcely in a jovial mood, asked, What kind of omen is this, if it caused only one man to sneeze? Whereupon the warriors laughed too, and the embarkation proceeded. Agathocles carried with him lucky owls, birds sacred to Pallas Athene, on a foolhardy expedition to Libya. And as his army somewhat dejectedly took up its position for battle, he released the birds. The owls perched on the shields and helmets of the soldiers, restoring courage to them. Doves are set free to this day during the religious processions in southern Italy. This custom stems directly from the bird omens of antiquity. Unusual occurrences in the temples were also interpreted as portents. The disappearance of sacred weapons, sweating images, the opening of the temple doors, etc., boded ill. Perhaps the priests, wishing to guide public opinion, may have contrived these miracles. A singular book ascribed to Hero of Alexandria explains how such wonders could be brought about by mechanical means. Incense, driven by the pressure of warm air, fell from the hands of bronze statues and burned upon the altar. A water siphon might produce mysterious trumpet tones at the temple shutters opened. When the fire was lit before the sanctuary door, heat accumulated in the hollow altar and the expanding air caused water to flow into a bucket. This made the bucket descend, and its motion acted upon the pivots, opening the door. This mechanical device was of course invisible to the spectators. It would, however, be a mistake to believe that all magical operations of the ancients were calculated to deceive. Not even the most ardent champions of the new Christian religion doubted the supernatural powers of the Hellenistic gods or demons, although they condemned them as work of the devil. Among the Greeks, as with all peoples, religion were merged with magic. Observing these practices, we must first ask ourselves what were the ethical implications in each case, and where the outcome was not evil, or in some way was to be defended, may one justify them? Doubtless the magicians and priests were, as a whole, earnest men, believers in what they professed. Many, rendering oracles, 
may have acted by suggestion upon the medium, Pythia. However, they might have done this unintentionally, as modern students of occult phenomena have shown. Today, even the skeptical do not doubt the reality of premonition or clairvoyance. During an era when large numbers of people concentrated their thoughts upon such phenomena, they must have taken place more readily than today. The Greeks, certain that these powers existed, wished to avail themselves of them. Yet it was difficult to know what benefit there might be in making use of this power, since the Greeks thought that fate could not be avoided. Some of them may have later arrived at the opinion expressed by Iamblichus, the Greco-Syrian. Better not to know the future and to await with patience the calamities of fate. Still, much interrogation of the future continued into Christian times. Iamblichus, despite his belief, was credited with the invention of alchetromancy, divining by means of fowl, fowl. After certain magical rites, one traced the letters of the alphabet on the sand, sprinkling a handful of wheat or barley across the characters. One listed the signs in the order made by the birds picking, and then sought hidden meanings in the words thus produced. Ptolemy, the great astronomer and interpreter of the stars, a contemporary of Iamblichus, vigorously defended the use of foreknowledge. A thoughtful chapter in one of his four books, On the Influence of the Stars, is devoted to this. In general, he says, it is good to know both the human and the divine, and to rejoice. Prescience, it is true, will bring neither fame nor riches. Yet the art of prognostication shares these traits with all other arts. When something unforeseen occurs, we are either overwhelmed by terror or our composure is destroyed by the sudden knowledge. But forewarned, we may await the future with dignity. Not all events of human life are caused divinely, nor are they all inevitable. Neither do they all stem from a single relentless fate, as there are also natural events. Man is subject not only to disasters inherent in his own personality, but also those born of general causes, plagues, floods, and fires, which destroy multitudes. Such occurrences must be explained by the absence of any opposing heavenly influence which might prevent them. Whoever exercises prognostication must take care to foretell only those events belonging within the realm of natural causes. These subtleties of Ptolemy are a late product of Greek thought. Originally, the Greeks may well have thought otherwise about astrology, for the course of the stars suggested rather the mathematical precision of the re and relentlessness of fate. Although astrology was no creation of the Greeks, not having been introduced to them in until late by Alexander, who had brought it from Babylon and Egypt, it soon gained tremendous popularity. Not only was the hour of birth considered important because of its astrological influence, but horoscopes also were made the basis for all important decisions. Chaldean astrologers settled in Athens and won wealth and favor. Berossus, a Babylonian, founded a college for astrology on the Isle of Kos. So great was his success that in their gymnasium the Athenians erected his statue, holding a golden lyre, the symbol of divine prophecy.